Hello, hello. Welcome back and um, good evening to all of you, um, even those on the Pacific Coast. I know you guys are uh, joining in a little earlier, but uh, today is our right 12th day of Make Jesus Culture, and we are wrapping up. Uh, we will have Kelly Baugh back in a little bit, and she's going to be talking about the publishing industry for those of you who are writers to kind of try to equip you and, and give you the tools you need to do your craft successfully in every way. But tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about transposition, an idea that Nikki McKenzie touched on in photography. But I want to suggest from the get-go, my, my thesis for you academics out there, and my proposal from the very beginning is I believe transpositions gives us a way to see all of life, okay? And so when we're talking about transpositions, I also believe it's going to give us a way to see the Lord's Supper in a way that's unified. Now, many of you may not think that's important, the Lord's Supper. Many of you really value the Lord's Supper, but I'm going to say that I believe the Lord's Supper was actually the environment to train us how to see all of life, in that God speaks through three different ways in the scripture, and it's all found in John 1, when he says this. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was not made. So check it out. In the beginning was the Word. So speaking of the actual things spoken, that it was spoken in the beginning through this Word, Okay, and remember it says, and God spoke and there was light. So God speaks through his word. When we read his word, it speaks to us and it teaches and reorders our reality. But we also are supposed to learn to hear God. It says, and the word was with God. So the word is a person. This is the person of Jesus. So God speaks to us in the person of Jesus. Remember, he tells us everything we see in Jesus is the perfect representation, the perfect photograph, the fir- perfect image. Remember that first or uh, in Hebrews and also in Colossians. Remember, it says that he's that perfect imprint of the Father. So when we see him, we look along the body of Jesus and we can see the nature of that Father. And it also says all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was was made without him. So all of creation, so in a sense, God thought up everything and he he just spit everything out of his mouth. So when we look ar- along creation, we see God's mind. We see everything that's in his mind. He speaks through creation. He speaks through his word. He speaks through the person of Christ and he speaks through creation. He does all of these things simultaneously. We can't just read creation and read it truthfully and rightly unless we read the word. And that refers to art, that refers to circumstances, that refers to people, that refers to emotions. Anything we examine in all of creation will speak, but it can't be rightly understood without the word of God. Okay, And it can't be rightly understood unless, I always tell people, unless Jesus fits your theology, it's a bad theology. That's why prosperity gospel doesn't work. We fit Jesus in that mold, prosperity doesn't work. Okay, The disparity gospel where it's just like, okay, sell everything and just live homeless all the time. Well, that doesn't work because he's now a king in heaven. We have to find the tension between them. We have to fit Jesus. Jesus has to fit into our theology. And Jesus, many times, our theology restricts him. There's so many times where I talk to people and I go, I don't really recognize the Jesus you're talking about. You're talking about this Bible or this guy that I don't know. And this is what we need to realize. And um, transpositions is a, an idea. I'm going to share it in a minute of who, who thought it up here in a moment. But transpositions is a way of seeing all of life. Most of us have been taught how to read the Bible. Okay. And I, actually, I'm going to submit that many of us have not been taught how to read the Bible. And I actually covered how to read the Bible in depth in my songwriting philosophy course and how to determine and mine out truth as a faithful interpreter of Scripture to get that meaning. Okay, We did that last um, yesterday. Okay, But I want to look today is how do we look along this man? How do we understand creation? How do we understand that. And we've talked a little bit about transposition, but I want to talk about it a little bit more. I want to apply it specifically to the Lord's Supper. And I'm going to be really bold because I'm going to go against 2,000 years of history. The Lord's Supper, many of you care a lot about it. Many of you don't care at all, but it has been dividing and animating the church towards aggression and violence for a long, long time. 
time. This issue of baptism and the Lord's Supper has been a fight that has gone on and raged for 2,000 years in Christianity. People have spilt their blood over it. They've died for it. Much of, much of what we see in our churches today, guys, has been fought over by well-being believers, by well-meaning believers. Has been Blood's been spilt. Fists have been thrown. Spit has been thrown. And these are serious issues, and we have to ask ourselves, why in the world has the Lord's Supper been such an interesting topic? And I believe it's been such an interesting topic because we're not understanding it. We've always kind of paraphrased it in this narrative of it's this moment in a service. And we've looked in other moments in our conference that the Lord's Supper, before the first 300 years, it was the entire way that God's people gathered. It was a full meal, fully animating people towards justice, fully talking through truth and learning it together, fully learning trades and creating together, and also fully telling each other's stories. It embodied all of these. It embodied mission. It embodied identity forming. It embodied truth learning and it involved the shaping of a craft. And the Lord's Supper has been kind of um, diminished to this one tiny little moment about we self-reflect on our sin. And that's not what the scripture at all is talking about. So transposition, we're going to apply it to the Lord's Supper. I'm going to evaluate some of the other views of the Lord's Supper, but let's just talk about this idea for transpositions really quick, because if we're going to look along and, and understand the creation, we have to know how we're hearing God's voice through the creation, through the craft, his word, and also through the character, the man. So creation, his craft, and his character. That's how we understand God, and he speaks to us, and all those things have to line up. So what is transpositions? We've discussed it early, earlier in talking about photography. I think that comes close. I think we've discussed it a little bit in light of music, changing keys and understanding how God um, incarnated as both God and man. But this idea of transpositions comes from the great philosopher C.S. Lewis. It is a way of perceiving the world. And it came to him one day when he came upon a tool shed in the woods And when he comes up, I'm just going to kind of read this to you. When he he describes this occurrence, he says, I was standing today in a really dark tool shed, and the sun was shining outside, and through a crack at the top of the door, there was a sunbeam streaming through. From where I stood, that beam of light with the specks of dust dancing and floating in it was the most striking thing in that place. Everything else was almost pitch black. I was seeing the beam, not seeing the things by it. I moved so that the beam fell on my eyes, and instantly the whole picture vanished. I saw no tool shed, and I saw no beam. Instead, I saw framed in the irregular cranny at the top of the door green leaves moving on branches of a tree. Outside and beyond that, 90-odd million miles away, the sun looking along that beam. And looking at that beam are very different. And looking along that beam and at that beam are very, very different experiences. So guys, what happened was C.S. Lewis realized something. Everything in all of creation is but a shadow. It can only offer a taste of the real thing it points to. So he sees that light dancing. When you look at light from the side, right, you can look along it. But when you step into that light and you look straight at it, you see reality. He saw that light, the sun. That light, when he was looking along it, it only pointed to the actual sun. He was seeing a shadow. He was seeing an evidence that the sun exists. What this implies is that everything in creation, trees, rivers, mountains, animals, even human beings, we are reflections of something bigger. The created world is not to be looked at the creative world is to be to look along. You look along the body and you understand how the body of Christ works. We've, t- we've said it before, you look along the rivers and you, you, you understand the power of God. You look along how a chick gathers her, or a hen gathers her chicks and you understand the comfort of God. You look along the spans of an eagle's wings and you understand Isaiah where it talks about being under the shadow of his wings. We look along the mountains and we understand the heights of righteousness. 
Okay, I love the definition of beauty that I've given in, in days past where beauty is dangerous. When we look at beauty, we, we look at the mountains, they're beautiful. But we go into those mountains and we're not prepared and those mountains will absolutely destroy us. They're harsh and they're difficult and they're rugged and all kinds of good and evil dwell in those mountains. And this is the picture of beauty. The depth of the ocean, he says, is like my love. When we contemplate the depth of the ocean, we can somehow put in, into a picture how far God's love will go. We're still trying to find the bottom of that thing. But if you try to reach down to the depths of the oceans and go actually search it out, it becomes dangerous. This ocean, this beautiful place, becomes a place that actually threatens your life. Should you? But we're, we look along these things, and they tell a message. John Piper examines C.S. Lewis's quote, and he says, So we can say that when we look along the heavens, and not just at them, they are now succeeding in their aim of declaring God's glory. We see the glory of God, not just the glory of the heavens. We don't just stand outside and analyze the natural world as a beam, but we let that beam fall on our eyes of our heart so that we see the source of the beauty, the original beauty, God himself. This is the essential key to unlocking the proper use. Listen to this. This is the essential way to unlock the proper use of the physical world, of all sensation for spiritual purposes, all of God's creation becomes a beam to be looked along or a sound to be heard along or a fragrance to be smelled along or a flavor to be tasted along or a touch to be felt along. All of creation now becomes this oyster for our creativity and also theological inquiry about who God is. You, we want to we join together now we want to understand that this is how God in, intended us to perceive creation. And when we look at that mountain, his word, okay, we see his creation. We come back to his craft, his word, and we look in it and he defines how, what you're supposed to read when you see those mountains. You're supposed to read his righteousness. And you look at that tree and you say, well, what am I supposed to read? And we see the tree of life. And we see disciples being likened to trees, being rooted and grounded in love. And we see a tree in the, garden of, in the garden at the end of time and two rivers running out and the, the new creation. When we look at that tree, we're supposed to see a little bit of ourself, right? Contemplating the roots, contemplating the limbs, contemplating the trunk. What makes that tree? What makes that tree? When, when winter comes, we're supposed to contemplate those recesses of our soul. When spring comes, contemplating new life. All these things now become self-reflective elements to go into God's word and experience him more deeply. A lot of people will say, well, I experience God best in creation. That's actually a biblical thing, but do not forsake his word. Some people say, well, I get it out of reading word, out of reading his word. I would say, do not forsake the man Christ, because if you forget Christ and you forget what he looks like, you might read the Bible and you might get a vision of what you think the Bible speaks about, but maybe not quite what Jesus is talking about. So this is a way we see all of life. We need to look along it. We, know, we don't need to just look at it. So I want to make a statement about art. Every single medium has a message. Every medium has a message. Your medium may be video. Your medium may be film like we talked about, maybe script or writing like Kelly was talking about. It may be what we're talking about tomorrow like sculpture or wood carving. Your medium may be research. It may be building buildings. It may be creating curriculums. It may be education. It may be drafting laws. It may be reading and signing documents. Your craft is a medium, and every single medium has a message down to those ordered lawful documents. It speaks of the order of God. If you look along those legal documents, okay, and you don't just look at the light, you look along it, you can see it's pointing to a God who's ordered. But then you can, in the same vein, you can also look along the surfer who's surfing this vibrant wave and free flowing and moving all around. You could say, you look along it and you say, God's order is, God's character is also playful, He's playful, and yet he's ordered. We need both to become like him. Do you see? It starts to shape our soul in that every person we meet now is a time not to divide, but to unify and actually see along their character, see along their failings, their trappings, their good things, and go, you know, I see God in them. I see 
Maybe the, I see the lack of God in them. I see a lot of times we look along things and we don't just see good things. Jesus speaks about the abyss. When we look down in the chasm of a deep, dark cave, we may not come to a positive reality. You know, God's like a deep, dark cave. No, we say there's also the antithesis of that, the anti-type. Okay, there's a type of Christ and an anti-type. So a cave becomes almost an anti-type. We look down into it and we see what life is like without God. It's a pit. It's despairing. And when we look along it, we see what life would be like without God. This is how to read all of creation. This is how to read his craft, his word. This is how to read the character, the man, the God man. And everything made has a message. So that means your hands, we've talked about this a little bit, I'm not going to review it. Your hands make transpositions of your heart. So whatever you're looking along and whatever you're contemplating deepest in your soul, it's going to start to make its way into how you see reality. And that's going to come out through what you create. So some of the, we talked about this past, but one of the greatest ways to examine the state of your heart is to examine a tree's roots, you, or when you see fruit that's going dead, you examine its roots, right? You don't start fixing the fruit and putting a bow on it and trying to make it look pretty. If the fruit's bad, you know, where's the source, the root. And when we see things coming into or out of our five senses that are not pleasing or not godlike or Christ-like, we have to look inside and say, the root, what's going on? What am I transpositioning? What am I looking along that's bringing that out of me? Obviously, I have a misunderstanding of beauty or I have something perverted going on inside me. And if you look at the scripture, it's all made of metaphor. Jesus absolutely affirms this when he says, I'm the vine. Now he's telling you how to read a vine. He's saying, when you look along a vine, I want you to think about who I am. You could literally stare at a vine for hours and not exhaust how much it will teach you about God. I am the bread. I am the wine. Communion, the Lord's Supper. Well springs of water coming up within you. And now I want to just hit on the, the, the Lord's Supper. We won't get to baptism. These are visual sacraments. We are supposed to look along them and see reality. See, we can't tell you what it's like when you become transferred from life into death or death into life and what goes from this kingdom to the next. So God created a visual image we could look along. It's called a sacrament. He created a sacrament that we look along baptism and we see what actually happened when you got saved. When you invited Christ into your heart, when someone stares at baptism, we go, wow, God put him underground. He raised him up. He put him down dirty. He brought him up clean. He put him out in one kingdom. He brought him up in another kingdom. He killed them here. He brought him up there. It's visual. We look along it. We've spent far too long arguing over the, the means of the sacrament. Oh, we should sprinkle. Oh, we should dunk. I have my view. I'm not even going to tell you what my view is. But that's not the purpose. The purpose isn't over 2,000 years of history, we have been arguing about these things. And I'm, I would say we have been arguing over the means. We have never argued over the message. We need to look at what is that medium? What's the message of that medium? That's what God cares that we get. And Lord's Supper, when he said, I'm the bread and I am the life, or sorry, I'm the bread and I'm the life. I'm the bread and I'm the wine, okay? This is my body, this is my blood. So now everybody gets weird because Jesus says, if you don't eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part with me. And so everybody's freaking out because they're going, well, does that mean that the blood and body, does he somehow incarnating himself inside this bread and blood? Um, Is he somehow in it? Is he somehow, how does he infuse himself with creation? This is a big question. The Lord's Supper is supposed to teach us how to see all of life. And I'm going to suggest that there's 2,000 years of fighting that needs to stop. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in brief. But transpositions, I think, can bring us to a greater unity. I think it can bring us together as church people, and I think it can start helping us view the Lord's Supper better. We can actually go forward with a deeper view of what this actually is. Instead of talking about the means, ah, should it be a wafer? Should it be juice? Should it be filled with the Spirit, not filled with the Spirit? Should it be broken? Should it be real? Should it be all this stuff? Instead of talking about that, we need to talk about what was the message so I was talking about the Lord's Supper in the past days. Is it was the whole service. 
So in Luke, when he records that first cup, it was supposed to ignite this bridal imagery of the Jewish feast. When a bridegroom would come in and meet the bride, if the father okayed that he he would bring a bride price and Jesus was going to bring his life to purchase his bride. And when he held up that first cup in Luke, he was, this was a symbol that when the father would say your bride price is okay. So the father in heaven saying, Jesus, your bride price is okay. I'm going to take your life. Then he would spill a cup and that spilled cup would represent, um, the, the, the celebration that that bridegroom was going to have happen. And so when he raised this cup up in Luke, this is why Luke records two cups. No other gospel does. It symbolizes this bridal imagery. And he's igniting this because this is what the Jews understood. And then he raises up the second cup. And this is what the Greeks understood. They knew that in clubs of their day that the, the second cup was raised up to hail Caesar as king. So when Jesus raises up a cup and says, this is my blood given for you, and he says, this is a new covenant, a new promise, the Greek culture looks at it and says, he's usurping the king. He's overthrowing the government. See, we missed this. Two cups. We missed the bridal imagery. We missed the political imagery that God was bringing together Jew. He was bringing together Gentile in one new man. We've spent all our time arguing over the bread and the wine. And that's the, the means. What was the message? What were people supposed to see in the art? That Lord's Supper was an artistic display because as they would walk down the street, they should be able to see the cup being raised. And then they would look, the Greeks would look and see that, no, the woman's, women are honored in that feast. In our feast, they're prostitutes. They would see that different people of stature, sinners, high people, low people, poor people, rich people, were all at the same feast. But in Greco-Roman clubs, they'd only invite the people that they wanted to associate with. So all of a sudden, this kingdom became visual. It's a kingdom for everyone. It's a kingdom for all nations. It's a kingdom that adds dignity to all the downtrodden, the women, the slaves. Jesus is including everyone it was politically an uprising. We miss that in the Lord's Supper. And both of those images are in Luke. He's showing us the coming together of two tribes. And most of you know about a version of the Lord's Supper. I want to just cover the elements really quick because most of our discussion has been over the elements. And I want to suggest that transpositions actually helps us see it better and actually can include a discussion of all the views. It's a both and. So we, we try to keep us from fighting. And there's a book on this at our site on the liturgy project about the Lord's Supper. You're free to, well, uh, to read some of my research on this. But one of the most ingrained and prevailing historic views on the Lord's Supper is that of Roman Catholics. Roman Catholics believe in what is called transubstantiation. So they believe that when you bring out the bread and the wine, the presence of Christ moves across the bread. It goes beyond and through the bread and the wine. So though the, your naked eye looks at it, it doesn't really see the bread and the wine change. Like the outer look of the bread and the wine don't change. But the Roman Catholic will believe that something happens invisibly to those elements, that they actually change substance, that they literally change into the blood of Christ and the body of Christ. You're literally eating his flesh and his blood. Sounds carnivorous, right? A Roman Catholic believes that the bread and wine literally become the body and blood of Christ. Of course, obviously there's some rebuttal to that as there is all these views. And I'm not going to state my view. I'm going to state that I think that there's positives and negatives to all of these and there's a way to harmonize. Of course, there's a rebuttal because usually the disagreement stands around the fact that Jesus's position and location in the Bible is said to be in heaven, right? So people argue, well, how is his body and his blood in the bread on earth? Because scripture clearly tells us that it's in heaven. So there's a, there's a locality. He's not locally here. His spirit is. But he also says in very, a lot of scriptures that he wouldn't return to earth until his second coming. John 16, Acts 3, Philippians 3, 1 Corinthians 11. So there's a definition that God says, I, Jesus says, I am not in those elements. There's also the, the, something that negates this in the transubstantive opinion because it's the idea of inhabitation. Jesus is very clear about the fact that the Spirit was sent to inhabit who? The believer. 
He never once says his physical presence would inhabit anything else, okay, including bread and wine. And I'm going to bring up a scripture because many of you are sitting here and you're bringing up the same scripture in your head that I probably am. And it's Ephesians 1, 23, when God says, and he put all things under Christ's feet and gave him head over all the all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So you go right there. That's proof. Jesus fills all in all, right? So he can fill bread. He can fill elements. But look at what he's saying here. He's, here. he's saying the body, the body of Christ, us, that's his fullness of him who fills all in all. So how does Christ, what does Christ fill? He doesn't fill this table. He fills us. And then we carry that filling out into all things that we touch. So I can, in a sense, take this table and I can pick it up over my head and I can throw it at Joey and break his head. Okay? That's a heart using this for evil. Or I can say, Joey, let's set it down, put a meal on the table and let's eat together. And I use it as a means for community. Same table, different heart approach. And that's what God's saying. He's not saying he fills all things like he fills believers. He says he fills his body. We carry around that fullness and whatever we touch, I can use this to his glory and I can use this to his glory and this to his glory and this and this and this and this and this. I can use everything to his glory. Okay? Following is what could be said kind of the, the, the opposite opinion of this. This is how I was raised, okay, is the Lutheran view. Lutherans believe that the presence of Christ is in, with, and under the elements, but it's called consubstantiation. So it's a sacramental union. It n never are the elements infused. So the, the, bread and the, the bread and the wine never like literally become infused with Jesus. But Jesus, in reality, does have a localized physical body and a spiritual existence. It's seated at the right hand of God. Yet scripture is clear that Christ fills all things. We just talked about how he fills it. But one could argue that the Lutheran, that this engages a little bit, that the Lutherans are missing something. They're missing a mystery of faith in who we are in Christ. And that seems to be the focus of scripture. Over 270 times it talks about us being in Christ. But then it also talks about Christ being in us 70 times. We tend to focus on Christ in us. Paul tends to focus on us in Christ. Way different message. It's way different focal point. Okay, but I'm, I'm saying this because what tends to happen is they, the Lutherans tend to divorce any idea that God physicality or his spirituality can, in a sense, kind of dwell a little bit more presently with us and they remove a little bit of that mystery of yes there's something unique going on in this moment let's just put it that way is and they, there tends to be a little bit of that mystery of what's happening that's removed now enters the final predominant viewpoint now there's a lot the evangelical memorial or zwinglian view memorialists believe that the lord's supper remembers and honors christ and his covenant toward us the stress is actually usually put on we remember him we remember his death and his resurrection right we've all heard this and we all do it but the stress is usually never put on god remembers us he looks upon the bread and the wine and he remembers christ's body and he remembers his covenant to us we remember his covenant for us, but he also is remembering his covenant to us. The problem with their memorial view is I don't think it takes 1 Corinthians 10, 16 seriously. It says that the Lord's Supper is a real participation, a communion, the Greek word koinonia, a fellowship in the body and blood of Christ. So you think about that. When I fellowship with friends, there's like, it's not just oh, I'm sitting at my table by myself and I'm remembering my friends. Oh, they were wonderful and they're here. No, the real fellowship happens when we all get in a room together and we're actually hanging out. They're present. So it's saying, it's kind of removing a little bit and saying, well, Christ is just kind of remembering. We're all remembering, but we're kind of not all in the same room together. And I think Paul's words in Corinthians would suggest there's more at work than, they're ju than just an imagination or a memory. Oh, I'm thinking about them. Or, oh, I'm remembering. There's a with togetherness. And I want to just pose a solution. This is 2,000 years. I'm being bold to get in, in here and even touch this stuff. 
Because I do believe transpositions solves this. It doesn't solve what's happening to the bread and wine. It makes room for all the views so we can openly discuss it. A Roman Catholic, a Protestant, an evangelical, a free church, a, a, you know, a, a Mennonite, an Anabaptist, they can all sit down and they can have a discussion because it's not really about the means. It's about the message. The Lord's Supper was never focal, focused on the wine and the bread. What was happening was they were looking along the two cups, and they were saying, whoa, Jesus is pointing to a bride and his uh, groom and his bride. The Greeks were looking upon the second cup and saying, whoa, he's speaking about a king. They were looking along it and infer- seeing, it was like a hyperlink. Remember Chris Powers talked about they were clicking on it, and it was opening up this whole world of meaning. They weren't looking at the link itself. The link itself doesn't matter. In a sense, the bread and the, and the, the cup, they don't matter. They're, they're hyperlinks. And hear me when I'm saying that, but it opens up a world. And I think transposition helps us to look at the, uh, the message of the Lord's Supper a little bit more holistically and talk about it and brings unity and harmony. Because think about it. Let's just think about that um, illustration with C.S. Lewis, looking along the light. Light can move beyond, across, through, and in, can it? It can move beyond us. It, it fa- travels faster than us. When we look, a, we can, it can move across our skin, and at the same time, it can move through us. It can move in us. We say, well, how? Well, it goes right through certain parts of our, uh, right so, through certain parts of us. It, it transmits through the eye, and it goes into our brain because our eyes are made to absorb it. But also the, the, the sun gives us vitamins. It's very physically impacting us. So the, the Roman Catholic who's saying we can eat this thing and it's actually transforming into Christ's body and it's nourishing us physically. And then the consubstantiationist who's sitting over here saying, no, it doesn't turn into Christ's body, but he's, he's there or the, the reform real presence or memorialism. We come here and we can say, Light can move in us, it can move along us, it can move through us at the same time. And I think, can Christ's presence in us be localized in heaven? And at the same time, can he press it out in us, through us, along us at the same time? Remember, in, I read John 1 at the beginning. It said in John 1, remember, all things were created through him, by him, and for him. Nothing has been created without his help. And then it goes on and says, um, talks about, I'm trying to remember. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Think about that. What's the very first thing God created? Light. What's the very first thing John equates Jesus to? Light. This isn't a far analogy to make because John is making these connections. The Bible's making these connections. But I also think it can be it can be at the same time that bread and wine can be beyond, across, through, or it could be in, with, and under, the st- transubstantiation and the consubstantiation. And think about light. It gives you warmth along with vitamins. Is not necessarily do you, your body ingest the light and it becomes something in you, but it can sit on your skin and it can just simply provide warmth for you all simultaneously. And the memorialism's view or the real presence view that Christ is really present there, which counteracts the Lutheran who might go too far and remove his presence or the memorialism's guy, pre, guy who might say, well, you know, God just remembers us and we remember him, but you know, it's like a table. He doesn't show up. We just kind of think back to when he was there. We remember it removes that personality. See, but transposition puts all of that. It infuses all of this together. But I want to submit that we need to start looking along the elements and think more about what they point to. Because the elements and the sacraments, I believe, were to train us. They are not just to resemble our salvation and our steadfastness in the Lord. They are that. But they are also to train us how to see all of life. And though God didn't give us trees as sacraments or water as sacraments, he, he made everything sacramental in the sense of, I can walk out to anything. I can walk out to my car. I can ponder a key starting my car. I can look along how a house is built. I can consider the, play, the way this house is built. 
And I can see all the construction imagery when God says you're being built into a temple. Christ is the cornerstone. Those are all construction languages. So we, we can see how Christ builds his kingdom by just contemplating this very house. I can sit here and think about the lights. I can sit here and think about how a microwave works. Okay, All of these things become as things to look along and they become sacramental. They become things I can look along and see the true reality. I can look at, you know, the air is something interesting because we say, you know, we, we don't see God, so he must not exist. And obviously that's a logical fallacy, right? That's a logical, Ill, in, dis, uh, uh, a logical fallacy is means it's an illogical conclusion because we can't see air, therefore it doesn't exist. But we know we can't see air, but it does exist because we see its effects, Okay, and so air is something invisible that brings about something visible and we know that it's there. Microwave, it brings about something invisible which brings about a change that's visible, heated food, which we then know is real. There must be something acting upon it. Okay, this is an absolute, when we get into apologetics, this is, this is something that describes being. This is just something that philosophically describes essence or who we are, cause and effect. It describes the liability of ethics and choices. We're not going to get into all that. But this is, we have to look along the bread and the wine, and we may not see what is visibly happening, the microwave, but when we take the when we partake in the bl- bread and the body of Christ, and just so you guys know, when I'm picturing the Lord's Supper, I'm not picturing a little tiny wafer and a thing of juice. I'm picturing a full meal. I'm picturing whole big huge loaf of bread. I'm picturing big sumptuous pitcher of wine or a chalice of wine. I'm picturing food laid out, all made from the ground. And the cook has assembled beans and rice and vegetables and flavors and spices and chicken and meat. And all these things are coming together so that the Lord's Supper doesn't... Remember I said the Lord preaches not just through the the creation, but through the craft, his word, and through the character, the God-man. Those are the three ways that he preaches. The Lord's Supper is supposed to bring all of those together. We've missed this because we've lost this tradition. When we come together, we see all the elements. Oh, all this beautiful food. The, The elements are no longer groaning. Somebody has taken creatively, put all these separate elements together into dishes that are absolutely amazingly tasting. They're no longer chaos. Creativity is taking chaos and organizing it into beauty. Okay? And so they've organized this. And so we see, what did God come to do? He came to order all of creation. So now we have a way of looking at all of creation. But he also came to teach us his word. And his word is that he is the, he is the Lord of the Supper. So this whole thing points to him. This is why we pray before we eat. Simple and simple as that. We're eating the Lord's Supper. And we're eating his bounty. The only difference between us and pagans is we remember the Lord when we eat, and they do not. But the Lord is even gracious enough to provide rain on them, give them common grace, extend food to their gardens, even when they spit at him. And then we learn about the God-man. We learn about each other in that meal. We become like him. And guys, I just don't think sermons are enough. I don't think getting up and saying, remember your sins is enough. We are losing the vision of Christ over all of creation because we've lost the Lord's Supper. I'm convinced, absolutely and utterly convinced of this. And why I'm giving this talk is because I want all of you to see transpositionally. I want you to be able to read creation and read it correctly. I want you to be able to read the Bible, his craft, and I want you to be able to read it correctly. I want you to be able to read his character, the character of the God-man Christ, and read him, understand him, become like him correctly. And the only place that these three things come together all at once is in the table. The only place. I will challenge you to tell me if they come into it uh, together in another place. But this, God is just brilliant with symbols. 
the symbol of just raising two cups in Luke, the only place we have in the Gospels. Why did Luke, a historian, record it that way? I think there's a message. The whole book is about Jesus going and eating with people. And who did he eat with? He ate with Pharisees. He ate with sinners. He ate with Gentiles. He ate with Jews. He ate with richer, rich people. He ate with poor people. And when it came together in this giant climactic moment, he raised a cup to both. He said, for the Jew who understands the bridegroom coming for the bride, here I am. For the Greek, second cup, understands the political nature of this, the king who rules over all, who defeats all enemies, who is to be worshiped, I raise the second cup. And in this one moment, all of the world was, it was absolutely reinterpreted. All of a sudden, the Greeks are going, wow, I got the wrong king. Or what's he saying? Does he think he's king? And the Jews are over here saying, does he think he's the Messiah? Does he think he's the, you know, d- does he think he's, what is he, what's he doing with all the marriage imagery? And when he comes and he proclaims even more so that he's the Passover lamb in the midst of the Passover, whose blood would you spill in the Passover meal? You'd spill the lamb, right? That was Egypt. Whose flesh would you eat? Okay, you would eat the unleavened bread. You would sup and remember the Egyptian event. So Jesus, in a sense, is grounding the Jews back in the Passover event and saying, I'm the deliverer out of Egypt. And who did they know that to be? Yahweh. I am who I am. The Lord your God is one. Saying those words, this is what got him killed. This is what made him politically inappropriate for the Jews. They wanted him killed. The second cup is what made him a criminal to the Gentile. They wanted him killed. This is a big drama. This is one of the most beautiful stories we have. Who has written literature with so much coming together in one moment? Only our God could create one centerpiece of all of creation and hide so much meaning in it that we miss it. And I want to ask you the question tonight as we finish up is why does this matter? Why does the Lord's Supper matter? Why have I spent so much time on it for the last two weeks? It's because it trains us in a way to see all of life. If we come to this and think that God somehow fills these elements and that it becomes literal blood and bread, well, then what's to say God doesn't fill a tree? That God doesn't become a tree? What's to to keep us from going to pantheism? What's to keep us to going to paganism, where God now inhabits things? What's, what's to keep us from that? But if God moves along these things and never has somehow kind of present with them, consubstantiation, what's to think us that he's not that way with all of creation, that he's more of a deist, that he just generated the creation, he put it together with some mathematical code, and now he, he left. He's not relational. If it's the memorialist view, if God's just saying, well, I'm remembering earth, but I'm not really there, but I'm just remembering that I, I gave the cross so that they could stay alive. And we just remember that he did what he did. But there's, there's distance there. Do you see it? There's still a distance that me remembering that my guests were over and fondly remembering, yes, it conjures up amazing things in my imagination. I remember the smells. I remember what it was like, the conversation. You know, I can remember right now I'm away from home. I can remember my children. And I can remember like my love for them. And I remember what it's like to be around their crazy voices and I start hearing them and I start like feeling my boys every time I come in, they're around my feet and they, they, they grab on, they won't let go. I can feel those things, but it's not the same as being with them. When I'm with them and I'm actually experienced, imagination and physical is engaged. And guys, if we embrace some of these views of the Lord's Supper that have transmitted, trans have moved down from generation to generation, it is really affecting the way we see all of life. But I would say transpositions gives a way to see every art as message, including the bread and the, the wine. And the bread and the wine actually train us in how to see art. They actually train us how to interpret everything we see. And now we have a grid to form a godly worldview that God fills people and we go and carry that filling to all things like Ephesians 1.23 says. 
We now can understand that he is far away and he does not, he is never going to be part of his creation. He's bigger, but he's also, he's imminent. He's with us. He's small, but he's also eminent. He is big. He's huge. He's separate. He's holy. We now have a grid to understand that. We now have a grid to understand how we are to remember him and he remembers us in every work of our hands. Not just when we break bl- bread and we pour cup. Think about what you're doing there. You're wasting resources. You're pouring out the cup for the good of whatever. You're breaking the b- body so that you have benefit for yourself. Isn't that what every job does? They pour out resources, they pour out money, they pour out time, they pour out energy so that life comes to their employees, hopefully their product helps people, okay? We break, every job we do, we break ourselves. We, we commit our body, we put into friction our emotions, we put into friction our time, we put into friction our treasure and our talent. Our time, talent, treasure all come into friction when we go and work. And when we do it, we need to remember the Lord. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember me when you're breaking your body in this work. Remember me when you're pouring out these resources for the good of all. Remember me when you're in this video shoot. Remember me when you're in this live conference. Remember me when you're speaking to this mic. When you look at the mic, remember me. When you look along the mic stand, remember me. All of life comes to life. And this whole message of the supper, you'll notice I didn't spend time telling you my view of what actually happens to the bread and the wine. I just really think it's like that old uh, was Mike Myers quote, we've put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable, okay? We've put all the emphasis on the wrong syllable and no longer does the supper make any sense. We need to put the right emphasis on the right syllable and the right emphasis is to say it's not on the means, it's not on the actual matter, it's on the message, What is that message saying? And that message preaches a kingdom of a king who raises a cup. He marries his church. He brings Jew and Gentile together. He invites the downtrodden. He invites the oppressed, the woman to the table who was seen as lesser in those days. She is now made equal. There's no slave, nor Greek, no male, no female. He brings servants to the table. There's no slave. He brings, and he says, there's no rich, there's no poor. This is a picture, an artistic painting of what it means to be in the family of God. That art has a message. And I believe, guys, why this matters is Jesus was equipping us with the gospel in the Lord's Supper. It is the only place we get the full message and the full audio and the full video. The full proclamation of the gospel, telling it, and the full kerygma or didache, the full community or koinonia, the full fellowship of the gospel. They meet perfectly, message and um, all that, the message is perfectly infused in the picture. And if we don't learn to see these elements this way, we'll screw up how we look at all things. That's why I think it's important. And I want you to see this video is not like my stake in the ground to say I'm right and everybody's wrong. My stake in the ground is to seek unity in the body of Christ and to seek places where we need to, we can go forward it as a body in seeing and engaging the world together better if we maybe have some better frameworks that will allow us to have those conversations. And right now we can't have those conversations because we're spending time on all the non-essentials, putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable, and we're overlooking what that meal really meant. And we need to come back to the meal because every one of, it's, it's crazy. All of our church structures today seem like they're undermining everything we're saying. We want people closer. We want people fellowshipping, and yet our stages are pointed away from each other. They're elevated so that we, we say we don't want to elevate ourselves, and yet we do. We say it's not the production, and yet we keep focusing there. But 
And we say it's not about technology, and yet technology is pulling us away from family and meal and friendship, and we're trying to get all these things back, and yet we just keep producing ways to not find ourselves there. (laughs) It's crazy. I have four children. It is wild how easily my family gets pulled away from the table. I have to literally, the only thing I fight for all week long, I don't fight to stay busy. It's super easy. I don't fight to stay in activities. It's super easy. I don't fight to entertain myself. It's super easy. What I fight to do every single week is the Bible saying, keep my heart turned towards my children, turned towards my family, the Bible says. And that's what the Bible says. When people were walking away from God, he said he'd have to turn their hearts back to their fa- the fathers, back to the hearts of their children. That's what happens. It's so easy to leave that center place, that family. And I fight all week to preserve the table. I have to make huge sacrifices to make sure I'm at the table for breakfast and as much lunch as I can and for dinner. And I realize this isn't the reality for most people because you do have jobs. But see how easily it is for us to be pulled away from the thing we all know is what's the strength, the glue that holds us together. And even research and science is showing that families who stay together are the ones who eat together. Even science is showing that the spiritual things we know in the Bible are true. And we need to fight for this thing. And we need to fight together. And transpositions gives us a way to do that. It gives us a way to fight for helping believers understand all of life, all of creation as testimony, all of God's craft, his word as testimony, and all of God's character, the God-man, as testimony of how we are supposed to live. It all needs to impact us. And transpositions, the brilliant little tiny insight of C.S. Lewis of how to look along creation, not at creation, gives us a worldview, poof, to literally turn everything into a hyperlink. We click it and a world opens up. We click it and reality opens up. We click what's fake and it opens up the whole, it opens up what is most real. It opens up, that light opens up the sun for us. And everything we're seeing, guys, is but a shadow in this life. Of, like C.S. Lewis said, the shadow lands. We live in a land of shadows. Everything is just a picture, a taste, a sight, a glimpse of what is most real, what stands behind the veil of all the heavens, and that's the real kingdom of God, which is coming, which is advancing. And God presses those most real things out through us. I don't think we're just making art. I don't think we're just making music. I think if it's done in faith, God says that he will test what is gold at the end and what is chaff. Things done in faith are gold. Things done in not in faith are chaff. So there's a sense in which God is making things that are eternal through us. He's actually partnering with us in the preparing of a place. He said, I have to go and prepare a place not made by human hands. And yet he also connects the reality that we're making stuff here that's going to last into eternity. So in some ways, he's got this place all adorned for us. And that's, again, bridal language. Because when the bridegroom would come and raise the cup, he would go away for two years and the bride would wait for him for two years, and he would go prepare a chamber. He'd go prepare a place. And when it was ready, the bridegroom, the bride never knew when he was going to come. Remember Jeff Dio's talk about the bridesmaids and having the lamps full of oil so when the bridegroom come? Because the bridegroom would come at night. He'd come in the secret place. And the bride had to be ready because he had gone to prepare a place. He was going to come like a thief in the night. And he was going to grab her and he was going to pick her up and she had to have enough oil to withstand the journey. This is all bridal language, okay? There's some amazing things going on, but this prepare a place and that he's done it by himself. And yet, look, the bridesmaid still brings with her her clothes. She still brings with her her lamp. She brings with her her oil. The oil doesn't symbolize stuff. It symbolizes her faith to wait for him. It symbolizes her hope, the lantern. That symbolizes her waiting for her bridegroom. And that's the thing she takes. And it doesn't say in the story that he gets rid of it. So there's some way in which God prepares a place for us, and there's some way in which he is doing it in in some way through us, kingdom building. And this transposition, this simple Lord's Supper, thinking about it, contemplating on the meal and the message of what it teaches us, can teach us how to deal with all of life and all of meaning. And it starts right here, guys. So hope you didn't eat dinner yet. 
Because if you didn't, now you can go to dinner and you can have a whole world of thought when you start eating that dinner of what it actually points to. And I hope what this does is enriches your meal times with your family. I hope it brings you back to the table. Why is it that our culture is fast food and food is grow, is on the rise. I remember even in the recession, everything was receding, but restaurants were planning 110%. They were on the rise. Restaurants are continually on the rise because food is very important. Our culture knows it, but what's gone is that eating in the home, that eating with the family, that DNA is being lost because it's being replaced by the fast and the furious. And some of the contemplation of what we're really doing is being gone because it's, it's just moves by too fast. We eat it too fast. We have to get on. But that message of the meal, we have to stop and we have to think about what we're doing. There's beauty in that that fills the whole world with the gospel. And we need to pay attention. Jesus, as we leave tonight, I pray that you would help us to contemplate your creation, your craft, and your character in every facet, in all artful forms, to be able to see all of life and it to come awake with imagination, it to come alive with the personality of God, that we would literally see you dripping off every branch, flowing in every river, not in a pantheistic way, but and, and, uh, to the heights of every mountain. That it, would, it would point to you like light. We look upon it. And I pray, God, that there would be a unity in the body of Christ over these issues of the Lord's Supper, that it wouldn't be a place to divide, that we could all bring our flavors of how we see the bread and the wine, but realize that really this is a transposition event. It's something we look along and we see true to what is greatest. I pray that you'd fill our meal times. I pray you'd bring families back to the table. I pray you'd bring churches back to the table. I pray you'd bring us back into homes, Father, so we can truly experience the one another, the love, the true nature of the gospel of being with one another, of perfectly assembling your creation on a table in the way we can eat, not only with each other, but with your creation in a picture of what it means for you to live and to fill all things with your beauty, that all things would testify to the glory of God. So help us with this task, Lord. We praise you for giving us such a beautiful world, such a beautiful world, and a beautiful word, and such a beautiful man in the person of Jesus. Make us like you more and more every day. In the powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll be back in about 45 minutes or so with Kelly Baugh, and she'll wrap up tonight with some great stuff um, to kind of close out her trilogy series on writing. So you won't want to miss it. Be back in a minute.